All right, so today, as you can see up on the screen there, we're going to be going over basic bowl turning uh, using the push cut and the 40-40 grind. Idea behind the, the push cut is just a different way of, of turning a bowl. Um, I myself, a lot of you guys know that I'm, I'm pretty much self-taught until I joined the club and started seeing some pro turners and things like that. So I always found it that it just made sense to me to go from the biggest diameter down to the smallest diameter. In machining, that's what we do. But for bowl turning to get good cuts and no tear out, it's better to go from the smaller diameter working up. And it all has to do with grain direction. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I have, okay, so some continuing education. So if you're interested in this process or after my demo, you're even more interested. So we've got a couple things. Uh, if you go onto YouTube and just type in Stuart Batty. If you don't know who Stuart Batty is, uh, he's one of the best wood turners that's around today. He is the guy who invented the 4040 grind. So those two uh, YouTube videos, free, uh, are demonstrations that he did at clubs just like ours. The first one is basically the, the extended version of what I'm doing today. And the second one is a link to his, another demonstration he did on how gouges cut. Just general wood, wood turning knowledge about the different types of gouges, the steel, the flutes, and why they cut better in one area of the wood than the other. Uh, the next one is Ashley Harwood's uh, latest instructional video series. Uh, this is only available from a website called the Wood Whisperers Guild. It's an online download, so you will not receive a, a, a DVD in the mail. You watch it on your computer. High definition, great video. Little pricey at 90 bucks, but it is a phenomenal uh, tutorial on the push cut and the 4040 grind. She goes over everything. And of course, it's Ashley Harwood. So, uh, then the last thing is our club, the North Coast Wood Turner. So, if you see something on the table that you like, find out who did it. Ask them. I don't think that it's a secret that members of this club love to talk. <laughs> So I don't think anybody will have a problem telling you how they did something. So uh, a, a bull. A bull comes from a tree. We have to start with a log. So this is just a quick little idea of where a blank comes from out of a log. You want to avoid the center of the tree when making a bull, the pith, because the pith has the most amount of movement as that piece of wood dries. Since we're going to be doing uh, green bowl turning, you would start with a fresh log, which I have in this bag here, and you're going to cut your blank out of that. Mount it on the lathe, turn, turn, turn. It's really that simple. And here's another little diagram of some different areas that you would be getting your bowl or platter from. All right? So, let's first talk about the 40-40 grind. The 4040 grind is a specific grind of a tool that describes the top angle and the bevel or the cutting angle of the bowl gouge, both being at 40 degrees. And it's as simple as that. So how do we achieve this? By grinding it, of course. So we're going to go over the basic procedures for sharpening the 40-40 grind. So you need a grinder and you need uh, some sort of a, a decent wheel on here. If you've got a um, CBN wheel, that's great. You don't have to have that though. You need some sort of a platform with an adjustable angle. So I, I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about the flute. So the flute of your bowl gouge where are we here, is important. You want to have either an elliptical shaped flute or a V-shaped flute for the 40-40 grind. Um, there is also the third type of bowl gouge, which is a U-shape, which will not work with the 40-40 grind. 
So you need to determine what type of tool you have. Okay, so you need some sort of an angle finder that can help you set your tool rest at a 40 degree tangent to the wheel. Uh, this is, Ashley Harwood sells these. Uh, it's a multi-angle gauge. You can get them from, uh, I think SB Tools still sells them, maybe some other manufacturers. Or even a traditional machinist uh, protractor might work, uh, or even one of those plastic protractors. So we've got a 40 degree angle on here. By resting the base of the gauge against the uh, tool support, bringing it up to the edge, we can set this angle to our 40 degree to the wheel. Simple as that. Using the same gauge, we now need to create a mark on each side, and this has already been done previously, but setting this up so that we have a 40 degree sweep on each side of the wheel as a reference for us to create the wings of this bowl gouge. Obviously, the, uh, I'm sure you guys have figured it out now, the 40-40 grind is a freehand grind. You cannot use a jig to create this grind, although there are some people that have found out a way to use the Wolverine, grind, or the Wolverine jig to create just a slight variation, but it's really, a, I feel, a pretty easy grind to create. So let's go over the steps right now. The first thing that you want to do, if this is the first time that you're going to be grinding your bowl gouge to the 40-40 grind is, you want to turn the tool upside down so that the flutes are pointing down. You're going to rest it flat on the surface of the, uh, the uh, platform and press it directly into the wheel. That's going to establish that top nose angle at 40 degrees. By doing that, you are going to flatten out that cutting edge and make it dull. That's okay. Once you've got a completely flat facet across the entire top of that tool, you're then going to sharpen each side of the wings. Okay? So let's go ahead and do that. So flute is down. Are we on there? Just like that. Now let's see if we can get that in the camera. Back down here. There we go. So you guys can see that that's flattened now? Okay, so that's what we want. So now step number two is to create that 40 degree angle on each wing of the bowl gouge. So let's start with the left side. We're going to position the bowl gouge so that the wing Actually, we'll do the right side so you can see it better. So that the, this side of the flute is almost flat or parallel to the tool rest. We're going to bring the bowl gouge up into the grinding wheel and we're keeping it in line with our 40 degree angle that we've created here. And we're just going to be grinding this until I can see the sparks coming over the top indicating that I've created a sharp cutting edge. Just like that. So you can see I've created a flat facet right there. Okay? Step number three is the same as two but it's on the left side. Perfect. Okay, so you can see that I've sharpened both wings, but I still have a flat on the very tip. Okay? Now, step number four is the hardest part of this whole grind, and I, I think you can all admit it's 
pretty easy so far. We're going to bring the flute directly straight in, so we're grinding on that rounded nose of the uh, tool, and you're going to sweep and roll to blend it in with the two flat side wings that you just created. Just like that. Now I had a question before the demo started about leaving a flat on the side. You can see I've got a little facet right there where I didn't blend in the curve of the front with the initial flat that I created on both sides. In my experience I haven't found that it creates any sort of problems. It's still going to cut beautifully. But you'll notice when I come back over periodically to resharpen I'll probably start at the left side like so and sweep and roll all the way around to the other side. And then that takes care of those little facets. I kind of try to think of the, this rod as a mini rolling pin. So as I'm sweeping it, I'm also rolling the tool as I come around. And the goal is to be as even as possible from your start and you're rolling it all the way around to your finish. That's just going to take practice, but it's really, like I said, it's really not difficult. And even if you're not exact, this is creating such an ideal cutting surface that it's going to cut no matter what. You, you're, you're still sharpening steel versus wood, the steel's always going to win. The push cut is just a, a general way of bowl turning. Um, you can use a fingernail grind, a standard bowl gouge grind, anything on the push cut. The 4040 grind is just a specific grind that has been found to give a cleaner cut, much less tear out. So, so I'll talk about that as we're actually turning, where um, you can just use a regular, bowl gr a, a regular grind on your bowl gouge to do the same thing. So mounting your piece of wood on your lathe, there's many different ways. You can do a face plate with screws, you can do a screw chuck, um, you can do it between centers, although that adds a whole nother step to the process. But my preferred method is with a screw chuck. So if you've got a lathe, you more than likely bought a chuck and the chucks always come with some sort of a screw chuck. The way this bowl is sitting, this bowl blank is sitting right now, is how our finished bowl is going to be. So the bark on the outside of the tree is going to be the bottom of the bowl. And up here closer to the center of the tree is closest to the pith. This is where the working surface of the bowl, the inside curve, is going to be. Okay? I've rounded this out as best I could on my bandsaw. Unfortunately, I had a really dull blade, so I couldn't get it perfectly round, but um, you get the idea. So to mount it with a screw chuck, we need to create a pilot hole for the screw to go into. So I've already got my center marked out here. And with an appropriate sized drill, we're going to mount that on the lathe. Put our screw chuck in there. When I put the screw in there, now different chucks from different manufacturers are, are different, but I try to find the flat spots. This assures then that the screw is going to run true with the lathe spinning. Okay. The elliptical bowl gouge, which is the preferred bowl gouge for, for uh, the 40-40 grind, is going to have a continuous curve on the inside of the bowl gouge. Something like that. Okay, the 
uh, V-shaped bowl gouge, which is Thompson Tools. Uh, does Thompson Tools make uh, an elliptical? Parabolic. Parabolic, yeah. That is going to be similar, but a very distinct V-shape or straight, flat wings with a curve at the bottom joining them. Something like that. And then the last one is the U-shape, which is exactly as it sounds. Um, going to be just like that. Okay? So the, the, the uh, elliptical or parabolic and the V-shape are the two uh, that you would want for the 40-40 grind. The U-shape is also good for what's called a bottom bowl gouge, and we'll get to that uh, a little bit later. All right, so the easiest way to mount this now that you've got your pilot hole on here mounted on the lathe is you could pick it up and, and lock the spindle and hand screw it in place, but why not let the lathe do the work for you? So if we turn everything on and get ourselves running pretty slow, then all you got to do is pick up your bowl blank and then just let the lathe do the work. As it gets ready to seat, the lathe will just take care of it for you. Shut the lathe off, lock your spindle, and then just give it a little extra tightening. Okay? Bring our tail stock up. Now that we've got our tail stock in there and we're secure on the screw and we're flat against the face of our chuck, this bowl blank is secure. As long as it's a solid piece of wood, it's not a burl or something with a lot of other bark inclusions, you're secure and safe with it like this. Okay? The first cut that we're going to make is just going to be a straight cut right across the OD to true all this up to make it into a round blank. And we've got a a little ways to go. I've got my tool rest set as close as I safely can to the piece of wood without hitting and I'm setting it so that my bowl gouge will be cutting on center. I'm also visually making my tool rest parallel to the bedway so it'll be easy to make a nice straight cut. Make sure everything is tight some face protection and lathe speed is going to be as fast as we can go safely fast but safe the faster you can turn this piece of wood the easier it'll be to cut and notice for the safety I'm out of the way so how fast yeah till the lathe starts to shake and then you just slow it down a little bit or you start to feel those hairs on the back of your neck uh, stand up. This first cut is a uh, push cut. We're going to make a series of three cuts to round this out and, and, and get it running true. So your push cut, your right hand is going to be at the bottom of your handle. Your right hand does everything in the push cut method of turning. It controls the speed with which you traverse across the piece of wood it controls the aggressiveness or the delicacy of the cut by opening and closing the flute like, like the throttle on a motorcycle. And it also creates the shape. By swinging the handle, you are changing the direction of the bevel, that 40 degree bevel. So wherever we move the handle changes where this bevel is pointing. If we keep the handle in one position, our bevel is now parallel to the bedways and it's going to cut straight across. If while we're doing that cut we move the handle out, the bevel is going to point in and we're going to create an inward curve. If we swing the handle out, we're going to create an outer curve. Okay? Your left hand has one sole purpose in the push cut and that is to create weight pushing down or pulling down on the front of the bowl gouge, the business end. And that's it. That's all your left hand does. 
The reason your left hand only does that, and I'll try to try to show this as I'm as we're getting into the turning. If your left hand pushes or pulls or tries to direct in any way, you will cause the, the cutting edge to bounce on the wood. Okay? And again, I'll try to show that to you when we get into this. So right hand at the bottom, flute is open, and just cutting straight across. Well, that's pretty good. Now if you can see, and I got a little bit of tear out here. So this is where the push cut is really good because it, it helps to prevent tear out. But I got a little bit. That's okay though. Um, you can see when I was first starting the cut, because it's an interrupted cut, it's kind of wanting to bounce on me a little bit. What I find works is just putting more downward pressure with your left hand to create more stability on the front of the tool. Okay. So now that we've got that round, we can move on to our second cut. We're going to flatten off the back side or the bark side of this. So our tool rest is now perpendicular to the bed. And we're close in towards the center. And that's why we check before. Just like that. So this second cut of our series is called a planing cut. So our bowl gouge is going to be pretty much the same position that we just had with the flute open. I'm pointing at about, say, 11 o'clock or so. We're going to be cutting this bark edge off with the left wing of the tool. So if you think of your bowl gouge like a hand plane, we want that cutting, that bevel to be almost vertical. And we're going to let the high spots of the wood come to the bowl gouge. So let's see how that looks. And each time I make a pass, I'm pushing in just a little bit to take off the next layer. So there's that technique, just sliding back in and out, just like that. You can also, man, this is it's a really wet piece of wood. The other, oper the, other, the other way of doing this is you can just step it in by, by taking off the first layer and moving in and just keep pushing in like that. So that looks like this. Same positioning. comes down to how you prefer. And if you're getting a lot of bouncing, it's because you have your you're not rubbing your bevel and you're you're closing your flute slightly, so you're really more scraping or hacking away at the wood. So when you get that bouncing like that, just turn the flute up so it'll shear off that wood in that planing cut. So I'm about at 11 o'clock, so the flute is, is open. You kind of have to find the cut. If, if you've ground everything correctly at 40 degrees, your flute should be pointing to about 11 o'clock. And you just kind of you're just kind of rolling it a little bit to find that sweet spot. All right, the third and last part of this roughing out to round it out, we're going back to the push cut, and we want to just hack off this corner. So to do that, we're, we're looking for something around, you know, 40, 45 degrees or so. And coincidentally, we're grounded 40 degrees. 
So this is where the push cut really is going to come into play. If the cutting edge is at 40 degrees and we want to take off about that on this, uh, this corner, if I have my bowl gouge set parallel to the bedways, that means my bevel is at that angle we want. By simply pushing straight in towards the headstock, the tool will be forced to ride the bevel and create that angle. So let's see how that looks. And I'm just pushing straight in with my right hand. Flute is open, same as before. Okay. Any questions? So far? Can everybody still see? So we don't have to get all the bark off. I'm just trying to get this smoothed out so that it runs much easier. Now you can kind of see what I'm going for here. These three facets were eventually creating the curve of this bolt. So now what we can do is we can start actually creating the curve. We can take these into a more uh, gentle slope. To do that, we've been making all just straight cuts. Now if you remember what I said earlier, when we swing the handle, we start to create a curve. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to start about here and we're just going to try to blend in this straight edge with this straight edge. A little lumpy, but we're just roughing this out. This is not going to be our finished piece. Okay. All right, so again, we're just roughing this out so it, so it can dry. So that's, I'm happy with that shape. Uh, finish is pretty good. Now we need to talk about how we're going to mount this in a chuck to turn it around so that we can um, scoop out the inside. The keys to successful chucking. So we want a dovetail tenon with an undercut shoulder, not a goose tail. So what do we mean by a dovetail tenon? So a dovetail tenon is exactly that. Just like dovetails on a box, it's going to be a slightly angled uh, chucking surface or a tenon sticking out. You can create a, um, a recess or a mortise, but I feel that a tenon is better in a couple ways. Number one, I think it's easier to turn than a recess, a mortise. I believe that it's a stronger surface for grabbing a piece of wood. And third, I personally, as you can see from the table, um, I like a foot on my bowls. So if you create a tenon, you're halfway there when you turn this back around to create a foot. So it gives you that extra piece of wood. To do this, we need to determine what size our tenon needs to be. So I know that my chuck jaws uh, can go to four and a half inch, which for a bowl this size is going to leave me enough wood to make an appropriate sized uh, foot when we're all done. So I've got my dividers set out for four and a half. And if you've never done this process before, you only want to touch the wood with the left side, so the side closest to you. If you touch it with the right side, it's going to grab. It's going to grab and it's either going to hit you or it's going to be a, a dart into the back wall. So coming in and I'm looking at the right leg to match up the scratch I'm creating. And now I've created a, a perfect round four and a half inch reference mark so I know where to turn to for my tenon. 
going to switch to a smaller gouge and we're going to face this off and create that tenon. So same planing cut, I'm going to step in And for a bowl this size, I want about a 3 8 3 8 or so long tenon. While we're at it. Get some of that excess wood out of the way. Now we've got the tenon is roughed out, so how do we then create um, create the dovetail? So you can use the bowl gouge that you just had, or you can use a parting tool or a bedan, or if you have one of those specific dovetail cutting tools, that will work also. I prefer the skew chisel. It's pretty much all I use it for, so. <laughs> So we're going to pick up some sort of an angle. The angle of the dovetail itself is not super critical, just as long as you have some sort of an angle. And at the same time, we are good. We're plunging in deeper at the point or deeper towards the center to create that undercut shoulder. Just like that. What we've created now is what I've got up on the screen here. This dovetail shape and hopefully you can see this shoulder is pointing in deeper. What that does is it leaves this point right here to seat completely flat against the face of your chuck jaws. This is the most important part of making this tenon is to make sure that you have a point that's going to sit completely flat against the metal chuck jaws. If you don't, if there's any gap in there, when you have this turned around and you're taking all this wood out of the inside, it's a tremendous amount of torque that you're putting on this bowl. It will allow it to flex against the chuck jaws. Now, by a show of hands, who's launched the bowl out of their lathe? I just did it like three weeks ago. This is probably why, because you didn't have that completely flat against your chuck jaws. So as you're turning the inside, that bowl is just sitting there flexing and flexing until eventually it just comes right out. So by creating that, so if this point doesn't contact your chuck jaws, it's going to move on you. All right? Now, with what we've just done, I've actually created a problem though. Even though the, the angle of the dovetail is good, my undercut is good, I've created a new problem. This surface is too big. So that undercut shoulder, my jumbo jaw here, that undercut shoulder is going to be wider than the biggest diameter of my chuck jaws. So when I tighten down my chuck jaws, you know I'm seated here nice, when I tighten down my chuck jaws, I'm creating a gap. But it's a super simple fix. Get our bowl gouge. We're going to notch this so that it looks so that it looks like that or that. Yeah. So I'm just going to step in again. And take this down until this, the step is just a little bit smaller than the maximum diameter of my chuck jaws. Just like that. Now, 
when I tighten up my chuck jaws, since that high point, this high shoulder that I created, will just ride along the face of my chuck jaws. So it will always maintain contact. Any questions on that? Good. You guys are all experts, right? The only reason I'm going with a larger tenon right now, yes, the chuck jaws, again, steel versus wood, the steel's going to win. You're going to grip way in there. But I would make my tenon larger because I know after this is dry and I return it, I'm going to have to true up that tenon, which is going to make it smaller. And then when I flip it around, when I'm all done to make the foot, I'm going to make it even smaller again. So you have to be thinking way ahead that this green wet wood, the tenon needs to be the biggest that you can make it so that you've got material all the way at the end, a year from now. <laughs> but yes, I see what you're saying. With wet wood, your chuck jaws are going to squeeze in there a lot, a lot easier than a piece of dry wood. Okay? One last thing we're going to do. Slide this out of the way. This knob at the end is going to cause us some problems. So we're going to take that off. Now I'm being careful doing this because this is wet wood so even though that screw's got a good bite in there it's maybe if we put enough force on here, we'll strip that. So I'm just going to take some gentle cuts. And I can see without that tail stock in there, it's kind of wobbling around a little bit. Okay. But before I take this out, I want to make sure that I put that live center back back in because I want that dimple in the end and we'll talk about that later. Okay, so if there's no more questions about this part, then we can go ahead and get this flip. Yeah, I don't want to use, you know, my dinky little two inch chuck for a bowl of this size. I definitely want to go bigger, but for me m more important is the finish size of the, the, the tenon to create an appropriate sized foot for the bowl. So we'll pull our screw chuck out of there. I'm right at the maximum diameter. Okay, so back to what I was saying. So I'm making sure that that shoulder, that high point of my undercut shoulder, is touching flat on all four jaws. If it's not, just turn it back around and recut that. Make sure I've got both sides tight. And we should be good. So good practice is when you do turn this around, get the tail stock up there just to hold it just in case. Blade speed down. Okay, so we're good there. Alright, so we've made sure that we're contacting good on both the dovetail and the undercut shoulder face, so we're nice and secure there tail stock in place for extra support and what we're going to be doing now is that same planing cut that we did to the bottom but we're going to be doing it on this face just to smooth it up and true it out. So right hand at the bottom of the handle, left hand holding down creating weight. Flute is open.
So either that method or just the stepping in, pushing out method. Now that we've got that smoothed out, we need to talk about wall thickness. So since this is a green bowl, very wet, it's going to need to be rough turned and then set aside to dry. General rule of uh, rough turning green bowls is to leave about a 10% wall thickness. So this is This is about a 12 inch, eh, 10 and a half. So about one inch is what we want to leave the wall thickness. So we're going to mark off one inch. And that's where we want to take it to at this stage. Uh, now that we've got that faced off, we've got it as balanced as we possibly can. We can go ahead and remove the tail stock, get that out of the way, and with our tool rest set at a height so that we're cutting on center, we're going to be doing the same cut that we did on this corner over here, that straight in push cut. The only difference is we're going to be flipping the flute over so now the flute is pointing you, so we're going to be cutting that angle in towards the center. We're going to be making V cuts into the center. Okay? For this particular cut, your left hand has one new task, and that is to support the back side of the bowl gouge to make this cut. So, what do I mean by that? When we were making this cut on the outside corner coming out, it's the natural tendency for the bowl gouge to grab in the wood and shoot to the left. A catch, basically. But when we're doing it on the outside corner, it doesn't matter. We want to go out anyways. When we're doing it facing in, it's going to want to do the same thing. It's going to want to catch and come shooting to the left. Your thumb, braced on the tool rest, gives your bowl gouge something to stop against. So it looks like this. Thumb rested on there, holding underneath the bowl gouge, and we've braced against the back side of the bowl gouge, pushing straight in. Once that bowl gouge gets about an eighth of an inch into the wood, then the wood will support the bowl gouge and you can move your hand out of the way. Thumb on the tool rest, plunge in. And I'm just pushing straight in, and because of that bevel, it's causing the tool to just follow that bevel. So bracing against the tool rest, start my cut, slide in. And I'm only putting about two or three pounds of pressure with my right hand, just pushing straight in and allowing it to find that bevel and do the cut itself. So just as we did on the outside, where we want to create that 40 degree angle, since our bowl gouge is a 40 degree grind, that means that our tool handle is going to be parallel to the bedways. And by pushing straight in, we create that 40 degree V cut, just like that. As we get further out to this line, we want to start creating this curve. So if, if wherever your bevel is pointing is where you're going to cut, as you get further out, you're going to slowly be pulling the handle further away from you, which is going to straighten the angle of that bevel so that you can eventually follow this curve down inside to the inside of the bowl, just like we did on the outside. Oh, uh, flute, so my flute is positioned up. When we were on the outside, my flute was most of the time pointed at 11 o'clock, or well, that's uh, 
not 11 o'clock for you guys, my 11 o'clock, when I'm cutting the inside, my flute is pointing more towards 2 o'clock. Okay? So handle is going to be presented mostly horizontal when you start. As you continue the cut, you may lower down a little bit, but the final, when you get to the center, you're back on center line. You won't see that so much here. Once we get bigger, you'll see it. Plant your thumb. Press in. And this cut really, it's really easy. Now that I've got that V opened up enough, I'm only going to be going in about two inches or so. Leaving that wood in there creates stability as we're turning. And if you can see, so I'm creating little V grooves down in the bottom here. We want to leave those in there. because those are going to be what we use for the next layer to start our tool. So I've got about two more cuts until I hit my wall thickness. So now I'm going to start bringing my tool handle a little bit further away. Give it a little sweep. Okay. Questions? Good. Okay. So next layer, same procedures, but now you don't have to worry about your thumb on the tool rest because you've got those V's. So you're just going to line back up with each of those V's and do the same exact process. on me. That's because of the end grain fibers are starting to get more pronounced the closer down I get to the center. So now I'm going to start swinging a little bit. So now we need to start checking our depth. So we want to leave a one inch wall thickness on the bottom as well. So our bowl is right about five inches deep. So we need to be four inches deep in here. And we're about two and a half right now. And the last cut over here, start swinging to create that curve. So we got about a half inch more to go. Since I've only got a half inch or so to go, notice I've changed my approach. Instead of being straight in, I've changed my approach so I'm more at an angle. So instead of creating a V like this, I'm creating a shallower V. Okay, once I get that down, now we can do a little bit different cut. 
This is uh, more of a, a pulling cut. So I'm working from the center out, knocking off all those high spots of those V cuts. And what we're trying to achieve, again, this is roughing out, it doesn't have to be perfect, but I want to make sure that that general curve is there and I don't have any, you know, facets and sharp spots where uh, the drying process may create cracks. Yep, we're right there. So just a little bit more. Just blending that in. And that should be good. No, so there I'm not riding the bevel. And the reason is, a bowl gouge has a difficult time when it is coming more in towards the center of the bowl rather than plunging in towards the headstock because of grain orientation. So if you think of this bowl, so my end grain or the top and bottom of the tree are here and here. As those fibers are coming around, those are sticking up like this or, or inside to the middle. As I'm coming around with my bowl gouge, I'm running into all those fibers and they just want to catch on the wings of a bowl gouge. And this isn't just the 40-40 grind, this is all bowl gouges. Especially the fingernail grind that's swept back more. The bowl gouge just does not do that cut very well, cutting in towards the center. But when you pull it out, it becomes more of a scraper and it cuts very uh, much more efficiently because you're laying down those fibers as you're cutting them. Now when we go to finish a uh, dried bowl blank, I'll switch to a different type of bowl gouge that's specifically for finishing just that bottom section of the bowl. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so this piece is done, rough turned, and ready to be dried. So the drying process. This bowl is going to take anywhere from, from three months to a year to fully dry and be ready to finish turn. Beginners are probably wondering why I left it so thick. So as this bowl dries, you're going to completely change, you want to do that? You're going to completely change the, the shape of the piece of wood. So these two bowl blanks were, I actually did these uh, August of last year. These have all been dried and they're ready to finish turn. You can't see it as much on that one, but here you can see it on this one. Notice we're not really round anymore. So if you remember that a tree is like a bundle of straws sticking out of the earth, sucking water up and down, those straws are all nice and tight together, the fibers of the tree. But when it starts to dry, those fibers start to pull apart, which is where you get cracks and checks. So this is how the tree is positioned on the earth, up, down, and here's the sides. Bark is out here. So as it shrinks, <coughs> you don't lose too much in the length of the fibers, but you lose a tremendous amount in the di diameter of the fibers. That's why it's gone oval like this. So we leave the wall thickness bigger so that when we go to return it, our bowl is still in here somewhere. Now unfortunately, this one is not going to work. It is over a half inch out of round, which is not going to leave me a round bowl anymore. The strange thing is, this piece of wood was like this in the tree. Why this one, this one only warped about an eighth of an inch, really ideal. This one, not so much. I suspect it's because my wall thickness, the bottom half, I think I was rushing. <laughs> and I didn't get this to the 10% wall thickness like I did with this one. So the pre preparation of your bowl blanks is very important. It's too thick. I'm probably 
you know, I'm, I'm about three quarters of an inch here and I'm probably over an inch here and all the way down to the bottom. It just was, as this is drying, the stress of the wood, it just couldn't move properly. But I am, I am happy that it didn't crack, surprisingly for as warped as it became. Wood is, a, is an amazing thing, <laughs> what, it, what it actually does. Um, so for drying your bowls, I've got a couple recommendations. Green wood sealer, and I keep mine just in these little tubes. It's easier than the big gallon can. Um, apply a sealer to the 100% of the bowl and set it aside and let it air dry. The, this box elder one, I sealed uh, the entire bowl and let it air dry in my studio. These two, I followed this procedure, which is just sealing the end grain and then I put them in a brown paper bag with uh, some of the wet wood chips. Other options are seal it 100% brown bag, wet, wet chips for nearly a guarantee that it's going to work. Uh, or you can get it online from all your craft supplies and places like that. So you can use latex paint. Um, anything to, to plug up those straws, those fibers. Uh, I've used latex paint in a pinch, and, and it works. Um, the, uh, the, the anchor seal, I think, is engineered a little bit better. It's going to be thinner, so it's going to soak into the end grain a little bit more. So I'd, I'd prefer to go with that, but yeah, latex paint would work. Well, when you're, when you're finished turning this, theoretically, you're going to be turning all of that back off. So unless it penetrated really deep, we're going to go ahead and seal this and then move on to the next one. Um, don't be cheap, just gob it on there. Uh, you probably could, yeah. Um, yes. I'm going to do the end grain both on the outside and the inside of the bowl. And not the rest, no. Because I'll, I'll put this in a paper bag with some of these wet wood chips. Now, you're, you're probably saying to yourself, well, how do you know how far to go with the end grain? Since theoretically, end grain is coming all the way right around here to the edges. So really only this much of it is truly side grain. So you, you want to seal you're going to be almost sealing the whole thing anyways. No, in fact, a lot of times I do. The only thing that's sealing it the whole, the whole bowl is just going to make it take longer to dry. But, like I said, the, the box elder one that I have over there, I sealed it 100% and it, it dried nicely, so... You probably should, but I don't think I did on this one. <laughs> no, I have not. I don't know, I'm not sure what the benefit of a 40-40 grind on the spindle gouge would be. I, years ago I did the microwave drying thing and uh, it just stunk up the kitchen. I think I did uh, cherry. You're not supposed to what? Oh, well. Okay, and don't forget the bottom as well. You've got, you've got uh, end grain there as well. What percentage of the wood are you going to lose? That's the first one that I've had that's not going to be usable in, in, in a long time. Um, but I have pulled bowls out of my paper bags and there's little hairline cracks here and there, but for the most part, nothing that I would give up on. So I would keep going with it. All right, get that out of the way. We're gonna fast forward six months to a year and now we have a dried bowl blank. So how do we get this back onto a chuck? So what we need to do is, this is where that um, dimple from the live center comes back in. Because this bowl is completely changed shape. It's not round. The tenon's not round anymore. It's not flat. 
but we know that that point is in the exact center of the bowl. So, live center back in there. Put our live center point right in that point. Make sure your fingers aren't there. And ram it right up against the face of your chuck jaws. That will secure the bowl blank enough that it's not going to go anywhere. All we're really concerned about is just truing up this tendon. So just a little bit of wood we're going to remove. One of the downsides of green bowl turning is all the goop that gets on your lathe makes it hard to move things around. So now that I'm going to true this up, I can see already that this tenon is going to be too small for my big chuck jaws. So we're going to be making this to fit my smaller chuck. So I've extended out my chuck jaws in here to about the maximum. We'll start off with a bowl gouge. I just want to do a planing cut on here just to make sure that this is running true, that it's flat. Okay, then back to my trusty skew. Lay out what that size is going to be. And recreate that undercut shoulder. Now while I'm at it, I'm going to go ahead and step down this back face so that I know we'll seat securely against the face of the chuck. Same thing that we did before. Yep, that looks good. Now while we're set up like this, I feel we're pretty secure. We might as well go do a little bit of turning on the outside of here. So we'll go back to the push cut. We won't be able to turn the entire bottom of the bowl because this is in the way, but we can get a good portion of it. And I'm just trying to follow that curve to take off just enough wood that I true it up and make it look nice. A little bit of torn grain, so we're going to go ahead and resharpen. No, no, once I've already created the 40-40 the grind, you don't have to go back and reestablish this. Maybe after 20 or 30 resharpenings, you might need to reestablish it, but no, it should be good now. So we're good with that. Now we can take this chuck out. One of the best things I did was buy a second and third chuck so I don't have to screw around with uh, putting the jaws on and off. Same as before, I'm making sure that I'm secure against that face, the undercut shoulder against the face of my chuck jaws. And everything looks good. Same procedures as when we roughed it out. We're going to plain cut this top surface to get it trued up. Now while we're at it, you can see, I'm sure, from the, from the bowls I have on the table that I like a little bit of detail on the rim of my bowl. I like just a simple inward slash cut. I think it was Richard Raffin who talked about bowl design and that you want the, the person looking at the bowl, their eyes to get invited into the bowl. So by having a little bit of an angle cut on this rim, pointing down into the bowl, it kind of does that, I feel. Just like that. Okay, so now that we've got that all trued up, we're happy with the angle, we can talk about wall thickness now. So this actually trued up pretty well. So I'm going to say we're going to shoot for somewhere around a quarter of an inch. I like, uh, I like quarter of an inch for this size bowl. I think it's a, it's a little bit more stable. I'm not into getting it crazy thin. I, I don't think that that's really necessary, but it's up to how you guys want to do it. So just like we did before, we're going to brace with our thumb. Thank you. 
you can definitely tell the difference with dry wood. We'll step it down just like before. And notice I'm curving the handle towards me to create that curve on the inside of the bowl to match the outside. So that's a technique that is just practice. What I do, if it helps, since at some point you really can't see the cutting edge, but you can kind of see the bevel. So you can imagine, as I'm pushing in, I'm actually following on the outside of the bowl with my eye. And I kind of just visually maintain a, a distance between the outside of the bowl and where I'm pretty sure the cutting edge of my bowl gouge is. And I try to maintain that so I get a nice even wall thickness. Okay, I'm happy with that. Oh, guess I didn't get this rim all the way cleaned up. Let's fix that. There we go. That's better. Okay, so the first third is done. Now we're going to go ahead and work on the second third. You can hear how it's kind of starting to grab on me right there. That's because, like I said earlier, we're traveling more into the end grain fibers than cutting through them. Okay. So now, for that last bottom part, we're going to switch to what I talked about earlier. This is our bottom bowl gouge. So the bottom bowl gouge is a very blunt uh, but fine cutting tool. If you look at it, it's actually kind of ground like a spindle roughing gouge with very um, with a very blunt cutting edge, almost square, uh, a big relief and a very small cutting bevel. The cutting bevel on this is only about a sixteenth of an inch. The wings on this are ground back at just about a five degree angle, so just slightly back to keep them out of the way as I'm cutting on the inside. The tool handle is going to be pretty well parallel. You don't want to be down at all, otherwise you're going to catch those wings. Uh, if anything, having the tool handle below center is going to be a safer cut. This is not meant for heavy hogging. This is just fine details because, again, there's not much of a cutting bevel on here. So it's still being very grabby on me. This is really some dry wood. Sometimes you gotta improvise and try a different cut. Back to that pull cut I talked about earlier. Oh, that's working better. For some, for some reason, my bottom bowl gouge is just not working with this piece of wood. Now I'm just checking with... So I've got a little lump right here. Okay. So I think we're good now. Now we'll switch to a negative rake scraper. Kind of finish this surface off. Okay. 
Yes, I did. So we're getting pretty flexible here, so I'm getting some vibration. So I'm just kind of got my fingertips on the back of here uh, to help support it a little bit. So the, the process is the same. Yeah, you're, you're going to uh, just skip the, the rough wall thickness like we did on that one. You're just going to take it to the finished dimension. It's going to be a lot harder, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you can see the trouble I'm having with this piece of wood. Uh, if you're doing the entire process with, with, a, with a dry bowl blank, it's, it's going to be tough going. You're going to have to sharpen a lot more um, to, to be able to maintain somewhat of a finish. Still not happy with that rim. Okay. All right, so we'll call that done. Now all that would be left is just uh, sand, sand, sand. So if we can go back to the screen. So my sanding procedures, I power sand first of all. Uh, I use uh, wavy sanding discs and um, a foam backed pad. So you want to start with the roughest grit that will remove the tool marks. Uh, getting good with the 40-40 the grind and the push cut, you should be able to achieve uh, just starting off with somewhere around 150 grit or so and then going up from there. Um, sand through each successive grit and don't skip and don't cheap out on your sandpaper. I, I personally feel that sandpaper is the most important cutting tool. Uh, it's, it's worth its weight in gold uh, because the finished sanded bowl is what your family members or the rest of us or people you're selling to, that's what they're seeing. They're not seeing what you did with all of these. So sanding is important. So another, don't cheap out on your sandpaper. Um, keep the sandpaper moving. So if you're power sanding with the bowl turning, you don't want to just uh, sit there in one spot because those grit marks are going to scratch and create lines. So keep moving with your, with your sandpaper, freehanding or power sanding. Um, if you do have to sand a rough area, I find the best success is with your power sander to rotate the lathe, the, the piece of wood, as you're sanding so that that feathers out your piece of wood. You don't have any deep gouges from the sandpaper. Alternate your lathe direction uh, for each grit. If you have the ability to run your lathe in reverse and then also run your drill or whatever you're using to power sand in reverse also. Uh, finish turn any sharp details after you finish sanding. So like on my bowls, I tend to put a curved foot with a little uh, OG edge. So I will sand all this and then I'll come back in and I'll square up that OG edge. So minimal, uh, I, could, I should be able to get that blind and not need to sand it. But <laughs> um, And then last is uh, after you've done, after you get to 400 or so grit, if you're happy with it and you've got all your tool marks out, you've looked at it under a light, then I go, I hit it with a gray and then a white scotch bright and after do at a higher speed and after doing that you're going to have it it'll be glossy almost like it's already got finish on it so i highly recommend that so you can go with a weighing method if you get a kitchen scale weigh up the bowl blank when it's wet and you can find online charts for all different sorts of wood what their residual weight loss should be once they get to a certain percentage of dryness. Or uh, get a cheap moisture meter. That's what I use. And uh, I just jam the needles into the tenon, which is going to get mostly turned away anyways, and I just periodically check the moisture level of my bowl blanks. I think I got mine from Woodcraft probably 15 years ago and I think it was like 30 bucks. They're, they're well worth it, especially if you're interested in, in green bowl turning. You kind of kind of need to have one. Yes? So after you're sanded inside and out, you've sanded the most of this on the outside as you can. Um, there's a couple different methods for holding the, the bowl blank on the lathe for you to turn uh, the foot, turn the bottom off. My preferred method is with the vacuum chuck, but I didn't, didn't want to bring all that. 
Uh, next method would be with a jam chuck. And then another option is a set of cold jaws. These are just accessory jaws for your chuck. Most manufacturers make them. And this allows you to grab finished pieces because the, the jaws on here are like a soft rubber. Hopefully we've got enough. Just. Now before I snug this completely down, like with everything that we've done here, we're going to bring the tailstock up and make sure that we've got it centered. Now I don't want to ram this in there. <laughs> Because we've got, you know, we're, we're thinner here on the bottom. Not terrible, but. And tightening these jaws, even though these are rubber jaws, you still don't want to go super tight. This is really just meant to hold it so that you can finish turn the bottom. So somewhere along the line, my center is not running true to the rim of the bowl. So I'm getting a lot of run out there. So I'm going to take the center point out of, so we're going to do this without the tailstock, but I'm going to leave the tailstock close just so that it's there to keep the bowl from coming off. Tough making this cut with the tail stock in the way. But I'm a professional, right Tom? I can make it happen. Oh, I got plenty. That's one of the nice things about the cold jaws is you can still get in and measure your wall thickness. So I'm just trying to create my typical little facets on here and I'm just eyeballing the shape. So what I'm trying to achieve is